Okay, welcome to everybody on YouTube and here on Zoom. We're just going to get started in a moment once everyone has a chance to log in. Some publications in hand. Okay, welcome everybody. This is the Friday webinar. I'm Executive Director Derek Auger of Conservatory Canada. We do this every about every Friday at noon Eastern time, and we've got a loyal group of you that come and join live, and some of you that watch on the on the YouTube CCTV channel. And we're glad to have you with us again today here. Um, we have Eleanor Gummer here from One Eye Publications. Those of you that are around regularly in these sessions will recognize her. She's going to come back in two weeks' time with Cecile DeRosier, and they've been doing a long series over the last two years looking at music by women composers. And so we'll have them back to look at uh, some Canadian composers that are a little more obscure, at least I had never heard of them. So I'm looking forward to that on the 26th. Next week on May 19th, Friday at noon Eastern, we're going to have Olivia Riddell here from Music for Young Children. She's the president and CEO and she's going to give us an overview of the whole Music for Young Children MYC program. And so I'm sure there'll be a lot of you uh, curious about that. I'll put some more registration links to those upcoming webinars in the chat box for those of you here live. And watch your email inbox next week. I'll hit you again with those so that you can join us for the final two weeks. Um, this morning in my mailbox, I got this from Eleanor from One Eye Publications. A, a great sonata, romantic sonata here by Louise Adolfo Lebeau. I played through the exposition of the first movement myself this morning. It's a really great work, a little on the harder side for sure, more advanced, maybe grade nine, even grade 10, I would say. But I look forward to learning that in the summer. That'll be on the website. I haven't got it on the website just yet. So that'll be on the website this weekend. Okay, cool. Really attractive cover. I'll also put a link to the website here in the chat box for those of you here live. And so today we're going to hear about Piano Kids continuing on in our beginner piano series here. Uh, Eleanor wrote this. She's going to tell you all about this. Her and her daughter have put this together. Uh, I've heard the presentation myself a number of years ago. I think it's really neat. It's a really sort of back to basics approach. Um, and I've used it with a couple of students in certain situations myself and really like it. And I have the books here on hand. So we're looking forward to hearing about that. If anyone has any questions, throw them in the Q&A or in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that as we go. And uh, Eleanor, I'll turn it over to you for now. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Derek. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm just going to share my screen and we can get going on this. Uh, just give me one second here. Here we go. All right, welcome to Piano Kids, and it's all about teaching young children. So some of the myths about teaching young children. I don't have the energy to teach little ones. Children often don't have the attention span. I don't know how to fill 30 minutes with a young child. Children need to be able to read before they can begin lessons. I don't have the experience for this age group. I would need special training to teach this age. So here we have some materials and ideas to help you become a successful teacher for young students and build your studio. So we are the publishers of Piano Kids, Violin Kids, and Guitar Kids. And these publications are all geared specifically for young children, right from the age of, of four. Why are we one-eyed publications? Well, we're big animal lovers. We love cats. So our original one-eyed cat was Spartacus. Uh, Sparty was a feral cat with quite a violent history. He was deemed unadoptable. However, um, he became really a, an incredibly loving animal. He passed away in May of 2014. And the very next day, my daughter visited the animal shelter to help with the grieving and found Max. So Maximus had been found by the roadside with a severely damaged eye. Unfortunately, Max passed away February 3rd this year. That was a, a tough one to deal with. So, But we are on the lookout for another one-eyed cat in the near future. So we currently have six levels in Piano Kids, four in Violin Kids, and two in Guitar Kids. So each level is comprised of a lesson book, an activity book, and fun book. Our publications are really about step-by-step -step note learning. We have limited distractions on the page, which makes them very suitable for children with attention deficit, um, uh, children that are on the spectrum. 
All the pages in our books coordinate. So if you're on page 26 of the lesson book, you do page 26 in the activity book and 26 in the fun book. So the emphasis is on building strong note naming skills, accurate rhythm and logical fingering habits. We are also, we have an iPad edition on SuperScore with backing tracks. All right, so the first book is our primer book and that's suitable for ages four to six. So notes are introduced one at a time with large print and uncluttered pages. So here you can see there is an illustration, but the emphasis is on the music, not the illustration. And I found that in so many of the method books, they're very beautiful books, but there's so much artwork. So I'm, I'm attention deficit. So when there's a lot of detail in the artworks, that's what my eyes rivet towards rather than the music. All the concepts that are learned at the piano are reinforced through age appropriate and fun exercises. So children at this age probably can't write their letters. So rather we do coloring exercises. So color the middle C puppy brown, the D puppy gray. Coloring isn't just a fun activity. It also helps with spatial awareness. So you're learning while you're having fun. Isolating new concepts. So in this case, E is a new note. So I generally say clap the rhythm. We sing the letter names, but we circle the new note. So rather than writing in letter names, we circle the new notes and identify them as E. So the left hand notes. Left hand notes, middle C, B, and A are presented one at a time. And again, the activities complement the repertoire. So this is the conclusion of the primer book. So in the primer book, they learn the treble clef C, D, and E, bass clef C, B, and A. They've learned the quarter note, the half note, and the whole note. Middle C is a logical place to begin for children because it's, it's centered, it's in the middle of the piano, but you can also see the treble clef notes go up and the bass clef notes move down from middle C. So moving in that central, moving from the center outward. So it's a very natural body movement for children, but also really for, for adults as well, for anyone. So from there we move to book one. We have a lesson book, an activity book, and a fun book. Now children that are a little bit older, say they're age six or seven, can begin directly into these books. So the lesson book features the repertoire. The activity book is the writing, the coloring, and the ear training. And the fun book has supplementary material for a younger student. So that means extra pieces, um, extra activities, extra note naming, coloring, rhythm, ear training, um, sight reading is all covered in the fun book. So book one covers treble clef middle C to G, bass clef middle C down to F. So we are now available on the SuperScore app. So again, notes are introduced one at a time. For children coming out of the this is going to be a review, but it's a positive reinforcement. These pieces are just a little bit longer. The pieces are a little bit longer, and the print is just a little bit smaller. The backing track that you're hearing is from the super small. Lyrics are an accessible range that allow children to sing along, developing their ear. So ear training is most beneficial before the age of six. That's the premise that uh, that Suzuki is based on. So Suzuki believes very much in developing the ear. Singing is a wonderful way to develop the ear. In fact, we find a lot of the uh, children that have gone through this actually have perfect pitch. And a lot of that is because of the singing. So I always have my students sing the letter names before they play. And when they're playing the pieces to sing the letter names along with, with them playing the piece. 
And then of course they can also sing the lyrics, so it makes it makes it fun. So I talked about clap, sing, play. So when introducing a new piece, we clap the rhythm, we sing the letter names, and then we play and sing. So you're basically isolating the concepts. You're taking rhythm as a separate entity, then you're singing the letter names, so you're dealing with naming the notes before you put it all together at the piano. So step by step. Let's just sing the letter names, ready? So. So this was the third lesson for this uh, for this child and as you can hear she needed a little bit of assistance with pitch but uh, by the second line she was able to sing the pitches so ear training absolutely ear training so here's the Mr. Bach so clean pages large note and minimal explanations and again this is the backing track I've included here just a little bit about Mr. Bach. I think it's important to for children to understand from an early age that these are these are living composers and I often encourage my students to find other music by that composer um, it's a way of teaching music history but it, it brings the music to life and gives them a little bit of background what instrument did Mr. Bach play we didn't have a piano this is the corresponding page in the um, activity book. So Mr. Bach is on page 12. So when you go to page 12 in the activity book, uh, you're drawing the note E and you're practicing drawing the note C, D, and E, which you've encountered in the, uh, in the repertoire piece. Choreograph the lesson. So when you're dealing with a young child, they're not gonna sit at the piano for half an hour. So it's about movement. So we have the piano, we have, I have a whiteboard in, in all the studios in our school, we have a table and we have the floor. So we might start with playing a piece that we are reviewing from the previous week. Then I might go to the board and introduce a new note. Then we might go to the table and practice drawing these notes in the activity book. And then we go back to the piano and we clap the rhythm of the new piece, we sing the letter names and we play the piece. So it's constant movement around the, the room or around the studio when you're beginning lessons with a young child. And I find gradually over time, we can spend more time at the piano in one sitting but when you have a young child, it's very important just to, to move them around and uh, they learn that you'll keep their attention span longer. This is a, uh, an activity in the fun book. So this is a Montessori concept. I, I taught, at a Mont taught music at a Montessori school and, and our daughter went through Montessori as a child. Uh, so Montessori believes in manipulating material, so handling the material. So in this case, you're going to cut out these circles and you're going to attach them to popsicle sticks. You'll leave one of the, um, one of the empty circles as a whole note. Then you can also color some popsicle sticks black to create bar lines. And now you can make various rhythms on the floor or on a table and practice clapping them. So it's, it's it's a, sort of one of those rainy day projects when the child hasn't had a lot of time to practice. It's something positive you can do in the lesson and uh, the child is still learning and it fills the lesson time and makes it fun. So this is how the left hand is introduced in book one. So again, just middle C initially and then B and C. So you'll notice the rhythm in left hand C, ta, 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 a, 
ta, 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 a. And we use, instead of counting numbers to begin, we use ta for a quarter note, ta, a for the half note, and I like to use big, fat, whole note for the whole note, or if you want to be politically correct, great, big, whole note. Uh, that avoids getting lost in the ta's. So ta, uh, 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 there's a lot of ta's for a child to handle. But anyway, it keeps the rhythm separate from finger numbers. So again, we're separating the concepts and I introduce counting by numbers gradually. Usually towards the end of book one, I'll count the whole note as one, two, three, four, and gradually introduce the counting by numbers in that manner. In the activity book, once you reach level two, they do write in the counting with with numbers. All right, this is out of the fun book. And again, all the books coordinate. So as I mentioned earlier, the fun book is extra material, supplementary material uh, for a child um, in that level. So marching thumbs, being able to identify which middle, which hand plays the middle C? Is it a right hand middle C or a left hand middle C? And this would go with page 20 in the lesson book and page 20 in the activity book. Three, four time is one of the most difficult times. I'm sure many of you have taught pieces like this where you end up with three four time it's not a common time signature in North America um, most of our music is in four four in fact the Bach is often heard as So we take, our modern society takes 3-4 time and turns it into 4-4. Four, four. <coughs> so it tends to be a challenging time signature for students. So on page 23, oh, sorry. All right, first, knees, clap, clap, knees, clap, clap is a great way to instill 3-4 time. And when we're doing whirling leaves, I'll have the students do a knees, clap, clap, knees, clap, clap, as I'm playing the piece. And they can pass the piece when I can do knees clap clap while they're playing the piece. Now another thing that you can do in the activity book, sorry, in the fun book, we have laughter. that's meant for them to play it's a piece for them to sing what I taught at the Montessori school or if you're if you have group students or semi-private lessons what the, the children love to do was a clap tap tap with each other and as we sang lavenders blue and actually this was one of their favorite songs these were children that were ages five to about seven and they absolutely love singing lavenders blue doing that activity the clap tap tap so again it's a way of instilling um, that three four rhythm in in the in children each piece first appears as a PDF of the page this is from on the, the next score. page the super score version appears with backing track tracks can be removed, allowing the student and or parent to hear the piece as just a piano piece. This is especially useful for the parent without a music background, or for a student to hear the proper rhythm of a piece.
The tempo can be altered to be slower or faster. A metronome can also be added to the recording. So this is from the Super Score app. And again, the backing tracks, if you have a child with, uh, that's got problems with rhythm, uh, the backing tracks are really terrific to help to you know to help them with the concept of rhythm the other thing uh, that I didn't demonstrate on this particular video if you hook the SuperScore app into a keyboard there's a learning mode where if the student is playing and plays a wrong note everything stops until you play the correct note so it's really it's a lot of fun to to do you can also separate the hands where when you've got a, a piece that's hands together you can take out, for instance, the left hand and just play. Uh, it will play the right hand for you and you play the left hand. So the children can play a duet with themselves. All right. This is from the activity book. SuperScore enables a totally interactive approach to the learning process. By selecting the pencil in the upper left corner, you can circle objects, draw letters, numbers, and bar lines just like a real pencil. You can also change the color. So we'll change this to black in just a minute. So we're adding bar lines. And we'll change it to black. And then you can also remove all the uh, all the work that you've done. So you can use this for multiple children. It's a fun way to learn to clap rhythms. All right, so in level one, way to introduce eighth notes. Now, we don't tell you how to teach. Every child is different and every teacher is different. So if you look at a boogie on A, the three bars, the first three bars are identical. So A, C, C, A, sorry, A, C, C, B, C. Simply repeat. So you could teach this piece by rote. Uh, I'm a firm believer in reading. So I have my students re uh, actually read the notes. You can ask the student what is the pattern in this. For the eighth notes, we clap TT, so it's ta, ti, ti, ta, 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 ti, ti, ta, ta. Uh, children love this particular piece. If you're on a keyboard, you can do some funky stuff like turn on an electric guitar, have them play it on a, with an electric guitar sound. So it, it's, it's a lot of fun for the kids. All right, rhythm imitation is something I do a lot, uh, just sort of on the spur where I'll just say, okay, listen and copy. So, ta, ti, ti, ta, 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 clap. And then they clap it back. I don't go into a lot of explanations about it. I just say, we're going to play copycat, listen, and then your turn to clap. So we'll do various rhythms using the note values they've learned. And from there, we take it to note board drills. So using the same rhythms, I put the, the rhythms up on the board that I've been clapping with them. Uh, and they one at a time and they clap them together with me and then you can play a game you could number the rhythms and they have to guess which rhythm you're clapping or you can do the the role reversal and they clap one of the rhythms and you have to figure out which rhythm it is they're clapping it's a good way of checking to see if they're really understanding uh, the the concept without a uh, test 
And that way you know, are they understanding half notes, whole notes, quarter notes, whatever the note values are that, that you're working on. And then I usually have them say, I usually say, okay, let's clap from the beginning of rhythm one right through to the end. So big breath and we go through it. So we just have some fun at the board. More Montessori concepts. So this was something I, I cut out, I bought some black paper luncheon plates and just cut out the centers and I bought some cording at it was Michael's or Fabricland. So we make the staff on the floor, we lay down five, five um, ropes and then we make the notes on the floor. Now one of the confusions sometimes is, is a note on a line or in a space? So for instance, F, is it in a space or is it on a line? Well, we all know it's in a space. But if you think of writing your name on a line, when you write your name on a line, the name would go in the space because you're writing your name on a line. So sometimes children don't quite understand what we're saying, what we mean when a note is on a line. So this exercise I found really, really useful for children. We are actually physically putting a note on a line. So we can have E on a line, we can have G on a line. Middle C gets its own special line. I've used this also with uh, children on the violin. So open A is in space number two. We count one, two spaces and we put A in that space. E is in space number four, one, two, three, four, and we put the note in that space. And from there we can, we add B and we add F, and uh, A followed by B, E followed by F. So even when you're introducing a new position, when you're introducing G position, G is on line number two, and they can create the notes G, A, B, C, D. So if they're struggling with note reading, this is a really useful activity. And making the staff, again, this is Montessori, we make the staff. So we learn that the, the ropes are equidistant from each other and we have five lines. So they're making the staff, they are making the notes on the staff. And they actually really love doing this. All right, so book one, book two, book ice cream. So that concludes book one. And from there we go into 2A and 2B. So we have two versions of book two. We have the straight book two, which is meant for a slightly older child. And we have it broken into two levels, 2A and 2B. So 2A begins with a review of middle C position and introduces the treble clef middle C to D a ninth above, bass clef middle C down one octave. The C major scale is introduced, as is the damper pedal. So this is the review of middle C position. And then uh, C position is introduced. So really the only new notes in the left hand are F and G. Sorry, <laughs> C, D, and E are the new notes learned. F and G were learned in book one. And this is from lesson book two. <laughs> in music, learning to recognize chords, chord patterns, scale patterns, and this is so important. The bulk of my teaching is grade eight and up, and I find transfer students often can't read. 
they haven't been taught to identify chords, to identify scale passages. In fact, there was one year I had a student at the grade seven level and we were starting a new sonatina in G and it opened with a scale passage beginning on G. And he was literally counting up, reading each note. And I said, wait a minute, if you look at this, you see how it goes from line to space, line, space, line, space. I said, it's just a scale. Oh, and he'd never been told that. He was actually physically reading every note, identifying every note. So Over the Mountain is based on a broken C major triad. Again, starting to recognize these patterns. On vacation, we have skips and steps, learning to recognize that in music. So the activity book, um, if you look at donkeys, it's, it's recognizing intervals. So uh, if you look at page 14, the first page, adding bar lines and writing in the counting. So this is where they're counting by numbers. Going into 2B, expands the reading to include the complete grand staff. They learn to read ledger lines, 6-8 time. G major and A minor scales, and the pieces in 2B can be used for the pre-grade 1 exam. So, at the playground, oh, this is off the boogie that you're hearing. octopus boogie circle all the bars that are the same as the right hand bar one so bar three line two you've learned the bulk of the piece. So it's actually quite an easy piece, but it sounds difficult, and the kids absolutely love playing this piece. So from the activity book, writing and counting in 6-8 time, and identifying intervals. I strongly believe in writing. As a child, I never did theory until grade 5 piano. Uh, my teacher said it wasn't necessary. So grade 5, I started doing rudiments, and I grew up in small town Manitoba. My first teacher had grade five piano. Uh, we lived in a town of 80 people, <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of choice of teachers. And I was told, um, here is F sharp. So this piece has F sharp, so you're going to play F sharp instead of F. Okay, uh, this is B flat, and in this piece, you're going to play B flat, not B. Okay, no one ever told me that sharps went up, flats went down. I didn't know how a scale was constructed. So when I started taking theory, all of this started to make sense. And I don't remember what age I was, maybe 10 and 10 or 11. And I said to my mother at that point, someday when I teach, my students are going to do theory from the first day. And I found it's really useful. Theory is never a struggle and they understand what they're playing. And that's so important. So as I mentioned, book two can also be done as a complete book. So it does move a little more quickly. If you're using 2A and 2B, there are more pieces. So this is suitable for an older child or somebody who moved through book one very quickly. So same pieces, everything that's in the complete book two is in 2A and 2B. There's just additional repertoire in 2A and 2B. So I talked about recognizing patterns. So I don't believe in staying in a position for very long. 
uh, when I first started teaching, I used Bastion, and I thought it was wonderful that my students were playing in all these different keys. And then we hit book three, and I said, oh, what's your first note? And they said, what position am I in? And I went, oh, oh dear, <laughs> we have a problem. They can't read their notes. They're just reading the position. So the roller coaster begins with a C major scale. <laughs> coaster is ascending and then so being able to identify scale patterns and not being locked in a position so if you look at puddles puddles is similar we're coming down here's the C major scale Pizza Day is just a fun piece in C position because everybody loves pizza. The spider and snow are entirely on black keys, so learning to read the sharps and being comfortable playing on the black keys. Ghosts is a favorite of mine for several reasons. Fun piece to play, very uh, colorful. Uh, we're using the whole tone scale in line three and four. But most important, it uses the pedal. So if you have a child who's on a keyboard without a pedal, it doesn't have much of an effect. So this is where you can start the discussion about the need for proper instrument. Also, the last note of the piece is the bottom note on the piano. So if they don't have an 88 key keyboard, this is a really good place to start the discussion about the need for, you know, a more appropriate instrument. So the piece does it for you. Rhythmic development. So uh, Rock and Raccoon is based on a rhythmic ostinato. <laughs> all the way through through the piece and you notice we're really moving around so we're reading our notes uh, we're moving there is no position we're ch constantly changing throughout the piece we have changing dynamics so there's a lot going on in this piece and a lot for them a lot for them to, to, to learn so we go into level three and we, again we have a lesson book an activity book and a fun book so now we have more scales and major and minor keys. We have chord progressions. There's a reduction of lyrics and artwork, so that really eases them into a more conservatory type book or classical book. Penguins on Parade is one of the first pieces in, in the book and tends to be a favorite. features of this one at the end of line one holding the note in the right hand and the staccato in the left hand but it's a fun piece uh, this is often a popular one for recitals so chord exercises starting to identify chords being able to play chords in the music 
And this is so important when they read Sonatinas in level three, grade three uh, book, being able to identify those chords in the pieces makes the learning so much easier. So the chords incorporated directly into the pieces. And you'll notice four, four time on round the cornfield, six, eight time for Hickory Dickory Dock. I've used a lot of folk songs in these books uh, because they're dying, you know, children don't know them. I've had children that don't know Mary had a little lamb. So it's, it's important that we keep the heritage of these, these folk songs that have been around for so many generations. Uh, the, whoops, sorry, let's go back here. Oh, there we go. Oh dear. Okay, imaginative dances. So we, minuets, our minuets. We just call it a bumblebee minuet just to make it a little more fun. And Italian terms are introduced. Contemporary music. The Enchanted Forest is built entirely on the whole tone scale. accustomed to these new tonalities. Um, the whole tone scale is one of my personal favorites because it's it's so imaginative. We have a Baroque unit. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to teach a little bit of music history alongside uh, the repertoire. So I often talk to children about if you lived in the Baroque era, what a birthday party might be like. You wouldn't be able to go to watch the movies. You wouldn't be able to play video games. Um, you could go to a restaurant. So what would you do? Well, you'd dance and you would uh, have possibly a harpsichord in the house that somebody might be able to play and you and your friends would, would dance. So it kind of gets some thinking about what life might have been like uh, before our present time. So there are traditional dances. So the Jig by Samuel Arnold, which is uh, one of my personal favorites. So by the end of level three, they have a concrete understanding of musical notation. They've really started to develop musicality, that is with dynamics, sh uh, shaping phrases, attention to uh, phrases, knowledge of multiple da uh, Baroque dance forms, and they've, been, they've completed the basic elements and are ready to move on to more complex repertoire. So we have book four. And in this book four, we have folk songs. We have traditional repertoire. We have jazz and blues. We have aleatoric 12 tone. We have triplets and we have 16th notes. So it's loosely equivalent to a grade two. So if you look at Scarborough Fair, chord patterns in the left hand. Some of the traditional repertoire, the Allegretto by Neef, Cherry Blossoms by Berkovich. We have lessons on 16th notes. We have a lesson on how 12 tone technique works. In fact, in the activity book, there's uh, the opportunity for them to compose their own 12 tone piece, learning to write the tone row, uh, the four versions of it. And we have aleatoric. Aleatoric, uh, the storm is actually two pages long and it has I believe another three boxes. So each box is learned on its own. So we have sunshine and thunder here. And then we have wind and rain. And I forget what the third the third one is. So the student begins with the opening and then chooses the any the boxes in any order. So they can make up their own storm. And it can be as long or as short as they like. They can play each box once or they can go back and repeat boxes as many times as they want. So the storm technically could go on for days. Uh, bright blue is a 
a jazz piece. The activity book now has a little more complexity in the theory exercises. They're writing scales. They're learning about relative major and minor scales. They're writing chords. They're sight reading, ear training, the opportunity to do some compositions and some music history. So this is some of the sight reading and ear training. So it certainly helps to prepare for future exams. And more advanced music theory, so drawing chords and inversions and intervals. A little bit of music history, so uh, they can read about the four primary area, eras in music. And I encourage them to listen to pieces. It's so easy today with YouTube videos uh, to for them to expand their musical knowledge. You're not just a piano teacher, you're also a music teacher. So encouraging them to listen and explore classical music. There's a technique book. So instead of a fun book, we call it a technique fun book. And this is various etudes by Hannon, Cherney, Bergmuller, and others. So we have scale and chord patterns, rapid repeated notes, Alberti bass. So this book can be used if you're looking for a technique book. This can also stand alone. So dancing fingers, repeating uh, a note on the piano with, this, with different fingers. A useful technique uh, when they get into the more advanced grades. And then some churny studies. So this is new. Uh, we just came out with this a year or two, I guess about two years ago, for teens and adults. So it's the Journey series. We have book one, book two, and a theory book. And this is from Journey book one. So it starts off with, you know, the same premise, middle C position, but moves very quickly out of middle C. So middle C, again, is useful because they get an understanding of how the staff works from middle C going up, middle C going down. And yes, for, for adults, it's a little more uncomfortable, but I mean, it's it's not, you know, they, they can, adults can play both thumbs on middle C. And then we move into C position, so then we can utilize chords. And so this is becomes more of a chord based approach rather than uh, rather than just individual notes. And this is from book two. So happy birthday, something everybody should learn. And how chords are designed. Why do we call it a G chord, G base B, G base D, the D7 chord. And the theory book. So helping them to understand what they're playing. We have a Halloween fun book. And this is for the beginners. So first year of, of lessons. It's just a lot of fun pieces and activities to do. And we have more fun materials. We have an animal songs book, super silly songs and warriors. I believe a couple of the pieces out of warriors are on the Conservatory Canada syllabus. We have a scale book and uh, I know the RCM has a scale book for every grade. This is an all in one book. Okay, this covers all the requirements to grade four and everything is uh, sorted out by key. So if they're doing the A major scale, on the opposite page we have the triads, we have the arpeggio, so it's laid out by keys and it goes up to three sharps and three flats. So it's all in one place, but it's one book. And we have a Christmas series, uh, three levels. And of course, women composers. We've been I've been involved with Cecile Desrosier in webinars on these, and there are more since I put this slide together. We have lots of women composer material as well. So some of the benefits of using this curriculum there there are no licensing fees. Um, you can teach the techniques you want. You know I find I teach different students in a different manner. Uh, just some respond better to certain manners of teaching than others do. It's easy to plan lessons. You can use these for private, semi-private, and group lessons. And it's easy to switch students from group to private using these materials. We do have 
uh, for level one, we do have an all-in-one A, all-in-one B. So rather than, if you're in a group setting, rather than having a lesson book, activity book, and fun book, it's an all-in-one. That's really great for group classes. So if you visit our website, um, you'll see all of our publications. If you subscribe, you'll get the latest news and offers. Resources page for articles and teaching ideas. And we're going to be adding to that in the next little while. And Cecile and I, of course, have been doing these wonderful webinars. If a child cannot learn in the way we teach, we must teach in the way a child can learn. And I think that's so true. And that's what makes part of our job fun. It's every half hour is different. And I think that's what I love most about this job. So thank you very much for having me today. It's been a, a real pleasure. And thank you for that wonderful overview of this method. Um, I know, again, I've used it a couple of times myself and just watching the presentation today, it just, it's wonderful to see how simply laid out everything is. There aren't a lot of distractions. You get right to the point of, of what it is that students need to learn. And I also appreciate the really helpful suggestions and, and activities you have for the younger children. That's something that I struggle with is how do I work with the young kids and fill that time sometimes when they need a break from that, you know, mundane reading exercise. So yeah. it's really good to see that. There's a chat available in French. Yes, they are. We have levels, um, book, uh, the, uh, the primer book, uh, level one and two A and two B are all available in French. Well, that's awesome. That's hard to find these days. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they're selling actually extremely well in Quebec. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. That's good to know. I know Kim's always looking for those kind of things. She has mainly French students there in New Brunswick. Oh yeah, and they're available at uh, they're available in New Brunswick at Long and McQuaid. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? Feel free to throw it in the chat box. Raise your hand feature in Zoom's great. We'd love to have more of you just come on live, even just with your audio. You don't need your video on. Um, the supplementary material I also found really strong. You've thought of everything, even the all-in-one book. It's really a great model that you've used there to put this all together, give students that well-rounded education, including the theory and the activities and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, Derek, I never set out to write a method book. It's just like so much of my life, it evolved. Uh, I was teaching when we uh, first started our school, we had a lot of group classes and um, so we, I used me and my piano out of England. But some of the stuff was not really um, appropriate in North America. There was one song, Lady Bird, Lady Bird, fly away home, your house is on fire, your children are gone. Kids were just mortified, right? The looks on their faces when we would sing this. And of course they use crotchets and quavers. So you always had to do the translation. So I started by writing some supplementary material. And after a while, there was more supplementary material than actual material from the book. So that's how book one came about. So then the teachers in our school said, well, where's book two? Oh, okay. So, and so it just kind of evolved and then as children started lessons younger and younger, I mean, when I started, you, the traditional age was seven or eight. You, you were supposed to read first before you could start lessons. But that's not the case because it's much easier to read music than it is to read English. The letter A has, I believe it's something like 13 different sounds, just the letter A. But middle C is always middle C. Hmm. That never changes. So it's my, my granddaughter started in these books at the age of three she's almost she's now barely four and she's almost finished level one and she's just starting to read books but she was reading music at the age of three without any problems it's amazing okay well, we've had this in the school many times um you know four-year-olds are able to read the notes but they can't read the words that's fine yeah and you find students at that age even age five they're able to read that staff notation clearly no problems. Yeah. No problems. Because it's one step at a time, right? You're not th you know, throwing a barrage of notes at them. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And in middle C gets its own special line. D just dangles under the staff. And they, you know, if you do enough work at the board, reinforcement, uh, then you're fine. I'm going to hang on. Oh, I've got somebody here. Who's there. The two-eyed cat. <laughs> who is still in distress after the one-eyed cat died. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. 
Yeah, I remember when I first started teaching it a long time ago too, is using methods like this, Edna Mae Burnham or Lila Fletcher. And you know, they they went fine. And it wasn't until I deviated from that and tried to look for something more interesting that things actually became a little more difficult in some ways. Yes, absolutely. You know, you really have to keep it simple. The younger the student, the uh, the simpler it has to be. Otherwise, you, you, they're just overwhelmed with too yeah. many. And also with the pages too, the University of Ottawa did a study on where children's eyes go. And when there are all those illustrations, the kids are looking at the illustrations and not the notes. So that's a major, major distraction. Our books are also spiral bound. The uh, lower level books are mm -hmm. spiral bound. So you can look at one page at a time. You can flip. Yeah, back to back. Yeah. So that makes it much simpler as well. They're not distracted by that second page. If anyone's curious about what Eleanor just said about the U of Ottawa study, take a look at uh, the webinar replay we have from Gilles Como. He goes over that in detail and you can see what's going on there. And I hope to have someone else who's done some research through his lab next year to come on who's looking at your method specifically that, that has some interesting insights. So we, I wanted to bring her on this spring, but we just weren't able to schedule it. Um, well, attention deficits, so I can relate to what the kids are doing. Yeah. Uh, when I'm the Toronto Star, I read multiple uh, articles simultaneously. Wow. So I'm, you know, I know what the kids are going through. Yeah, yeah. Kim, I've just brought you on. I see your hand up there. You can take yourself off mute or you are off mute now. If you have a question, go ahead. Um, so all of the levels are available in French for the, up to level uh, 1B, you said? 2B, yeah. B, so Okay, in, including the activity books as well? Not the fun books, but the activity books are in French. That's fantastic, because I've been struggling so hard since we moved here from Ontario to find things for all my little guys. Yeah. And of course, learning French all over again and it's different than the Quebecois that we learned in high school. This is Shiak. So it's trying to come up with things for the students. And it's been a challenge. And I was using your piano kids in Ontario for my English students, but I didn't realize you had them in French. So yeah. I want to say thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> um, they are available on the website or like I say, Long and McQuaid carries them. If they don't have them in stock, they can, they can order them in. But I have been selling a lot to Long and McQuaid. I just don't know where they go. I, I understand, yeah. But thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this webinar too. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about everything that you do, Eleanor. I've known you for a number of years now. We met at a at an Ormta convention, perhaps it was in Chatham. I can't remember now for sure, but... Um, the, the, everything that you're doing with the women composers and the amount that you've published in the last year and a half or two years on that front's amazing. Then you've got this piano kids, piano guitar, piano violin. You run a music school in Whitney. Uh, you do some examining for us. You're traveling around promoting all this material and you have a full-time teaching studio. I don't know how you have time to do it all, but it's really truly amazing and wonderful that we get the benefit of your endless, boundless energy to put all of this stuff together and, and, and so well too. We really enjoy the presentation today oh super score app wonderful to see this all you've got these modern backing tracks available in the super score app that for those that want to be connected to the screen in that manner that's really wonderful too I found it. it's the ears you know i use it sometimes when i have kids some kids really struggle with rhythm and mm -hmm. you can if you watch them walk they often are the children that don't you know they're they're, they're clumsy when they walk so it's an internal thing mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 coordination it's it's just uh, so the backing tracks sometimes really help uh they internalize the rhythm yeah when you know nothing else will work i use backing tracks all the time at every lesson for yeah. students yeah and it's the only it's not the only thing but one of the only things the quickest way to really instill that rhythm and install it into the body for those that you know like you said aren't good moving yeah you, you're right you can see it when they move Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good point. Well, listen, I've learned a lot here today and I hope you all have as well. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, anyone watching the replay later, hopefully you've enjoyed this as well. And hope you can join us next Friday uh, with Olivia Riddell, who's going to come on from Music for Young Children. We'll get her ideas about what her mother, Frances Belotus, created in the NYC program. Um, and Cheryl's saying, yeah, you have two students that you'd love to try this program with, and you have SuperScore. Wonderful. And you can download everything right through SuperScore app. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's actually, there are freebies on the SuperScore app if you just want to try it out. Yeah. Uh, there's some free material. And yeah, then if you decide.